he sat up in the bed. Now, my dad, I had never seen him in, in horror. I never saw any fear in him. But he, he sat up screaming, no, no, go away. This is Touched by Heaven. Everyday encounters with God, those moments when heaven and earth collide and we see God. We see his hand reaching out to us, attempting to get our attention, inviting us into a closer relationship. Here we share stories of encounter with angels, divine intervention, prophetic dreams, visions, near-death experiences, big and little God incidents. I'm your host, Trapper Jack. Welcome. This will be episode 131. On Wednesday mornings, I, I sit down with my wife, Elizabeth, and son, Stephen, and we name the podcast. I tell them what the story is about. In this case, it's Jamie. And this incredible journey, this arc throughout his life and his two siblings of growing up in a home that has no love coming from the top, in fact, quite the opposite, this dark, extremely dark beginning where spirituality only comes from the dark side, and yet somehow all three today are shining so brightly. How does that happen? Well, sometimes children find God despite parents. Here's Jamie on Touched by Heaven. Everyday Encounters with God. Hello. Mr. James, how you doing? <laughs> doing good. What, what do you want me to call you, Trapper Jack? or? Let me check my ID today. Hold on here. Let me see what I got. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Well, you got off to kind of a rocky start in your life, so I can... You know, you're, you're, <laughs> you're going to go one way or the other, you know? and uh... Oh, I got a story. At the age of five, we, we were living in, in a trailer park and north of Pittsburgh. My dad and my mom met uh, in theater, and they did radio theater before uh, they moved on. Uh, my dad, uh, through the years, my dad produced uh, Broadway shows from Pittsburgh called the Civic Light Opera. I met Ray Bolger, the Scarecrow and Wizard of Oz, when I was 11. Um, they had Shirley Jones, Rona Martin, Jack Benny. You know, that, that was kind of life that we grew up with on the outside. But uh, when I was five, Dad, um, I remember Dad was a very happy man at that time, and he had a dream and bought this house. Uh, in his dream, a fellow that he knew uh, came to him and said he had died and wanted my dad to buy the house. Uh, when Dad found the house, um, it had been owned by three other families, and they moved out within months because it was haunted, and Dad bought the house. Um, I remember at five, my sister was 10. My little brother is about a year and a half. This is my first introduction to the spirit world. Um, we were, my sister and I were in the living room. It was about nine o'clock at night. We were sitting on a couch, just playing, talking. My parents, it was our first night in the house. My brother's down around the corner at the end of the hall in the bedroom with the door closed uh, in his crib. He started crying for his milk bottle. We hear the front door open and close, high heel clickings going down to the bedroom where the baby was. The door opens, his voice got louder. High heel clickings come out, the door closes down the hallway. And we were asking mom, my mom's in tennis shoes. She's not in high heels. But we were being kids trying to figure out who's in the house. She, the steps come right into the living room, up to the couch where we were, and nobody was there. I mean, I jumped in my sister's arms. I was crying. She was crying. My parents came home about 15 minutes after that. We told them what happened. My dad said we were lying. My mom said that something had to have happened. And that was the beginning of 13 years of fear in that house. Were you told any warnings at all of what you were moving into? No. We had no knowledge. All we knew is we were getting moved out in the country into a house. We were excited about that. We had no knowledge of this. My parents didn't share anything until I was about eight or nine years old. Long story short, the, the house, the guy that owned the house was into witchcraft and Satanism. And an, oh, dad called it the halfway house between this world and the next. Um, we heard constant chattering, uh, like a party was going on, uh, footsteps. Um, when I was about 13 through about 15, I would have visitations at night where my bed would be sagging down like somebody was there, even to the point where I had to hang on to the other side so I wouldn't fall off. And I'd look and nobody was there and I'd be crying. Um, at the age of eight, eight years old, there was a family that was coming in for a couple of years. It was like the third year they were visiting. I remember waking up on Saturday morning 
the father of the family that was visiting was arguing with my dad. My dad was yelling back at him. And the man was saying, I know you have an old woman that lives here. Who is she? My dad said, we don't have anybody like that. The man cursed and said, I know you do. I saw her last night. I went to use the bathroom. She came out of the bedroom, which is the same bedroom my brother was in. She went, smiled, went in the bathroom, closed the door. He said, I waited about 20 minutes. I knocked on the door, no answer. I thought something happened. I went in. She, she wasn't in there. There's no way out of that room. You guys lived here how long? 13 years? Um, I, was in, I was in that house for 13 years, and then I moved out when I was 18. We had no education on spiritual things. Yeah, but you're putting up with this for 13 years? All of you are just kind of going, oh, well? Well, my, the house and my dad's personality became one. Ooh. And my dad, we had weekly beatings. My sister had to revive me several times because I wasn't breathing. He shot me in the head. He did what? Shot me in the head with the 38. Um, he was a drunk. Uh, he was so smart, he couldn't hold a job. What, what, Mom, ex, explain huh? this 38 uh, shot that didn't kill you. I was, I was six years old, and I don't know why he did, but normally they got drunk at night. But on this one Sunday, he was, he was drinking whiskey. He normally drank wine. And when he drinks whiskey, uh, he get, he's real mean. So he came out the, about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I was outside playing. And we're out in the country. And he said, I'm a cowboy. You're an Indian. Run. Uh, and I saw the 38 in his hand. I said, no, oh, I'm not doing this. And he said it again. I said, no, I don't want to play. And he started raising the, the gun and I ran. He fired it and it grazed the back of my head. It's, I hurt. That's all I got to say. It burned. It hurt. I screamed. I grabbed the back of my head. And at six years old, I, there's only so much you can do to defend yourself. but. My mom comes out and says, what happened? And I said, I'm screaming, mommy. I said, he shot me. (laughs) But she was an alcoholic as well. And during that time, women did not leave their husbands in the 60s. That was dad. Uh, At the age of 11, um, it was a Saturday night. Every Saturday, mom would cook homemade spaghetti. But we wouldn't eat till about 10 or 11 at night because they wanted to get their drinking in first. And then they call a family and eat. Um, And mind you, to answer the question you were asking, the mindset as kids, uh, myself, my brother, and my sister, we we stuck together to survive. And we were the support group that we had. So this one night, uh, we were eating. And behind Dad was a painted picture my mom painted of the beach. It was about two and a half feet wide and about um, two feet high. And the picture goes up 90 degrees and just hangs there by itself. And we just stopped eating, staring at this thing. And then dad looks up and says, what, you never seen a man eat spaghetti before? We're like, dad, dad behind you, behind you. And he turns around and this thing starts swinging back and forth. And then we heard a crash upstairs. The the stairwell to the upper, the second floor of the house uh, came, went up from the kitchen. So dad tells my sister and I to go up and see what it is. Knowing you have to know my father, if you don't do what he says, he'll beat you until you're unconscious. So uh, we went up and I'm holding my sister's hand. We come around the corner and we saw a half filled wine glass floating from the desk is about two feet off the floor. Gently touching the floor and tipping over. Man, we flew down those stairs so fast. We didn't run down the steps. We jumped one big jump and hit the floor crying hysterically. So we told him what happened. And he said, go up and clean. He said, nah, nah, that's your friend. We're not going to do that. Um, am I making sense? Yeah, you're making It's crazy, Good. crazy, but it's... Uh... It's insane. Around about age 18, Jamie, and actually his brother too, both for the first time, hear about Jesus. So they know there's a spiritual world out there. They just don't know that it's not all dark, that there is a heavenly spiritual world. And this is the time that Jamie, and actually his brother too, on pretty much the same day in different circumstances, find out about Jesus. Now, in, in Jamie's case, someone just flips him a coin. This is back in the 70s. Flips him a coin, says, look at the date, you know, 1973, whatever it was. 
And uh, the guy says, do you know why it's 1973? No, because 1,973 years ago, a guy named Jesus was born into the world. Jamie was totally oblivious to this. Jamie's sister has found Christ. She and her husband are helping Jamie now talk to the pastor and keep him coming in the right direction. So three weeks later, after uh, talking with the pastor, I got my information. I decided to ask Christ into my life. And I figured if it was real, I have everything to gain. But if it wasn't, then I have nothing to lose. And uh, it was a quiet, I sensed his presence come into me. It was a real quiet presence. Long story short, I came home one day. My dad was beating on my brother. He was 15. Full force, he used to box. Uh, I was getting bigger. Uh, I walked in on it. Uh, and I said, what are you doing? He's, Mick said, yeah, what are you doing? My dad looked and realized he now has two young men growing up to face instead of little kids to beat on. And he told us to get out of the house. And we said, fine. Um, we had to take my dad to, to court because um, my sister asked for custody of my brother. because He was still 15. Uh, I needed money for school, so I joined the Marines. Uh, my first bunk partner was studying to be a Catholic priest, and he knew a lot about the Bible, but he wanted to have a family, so he quit the priesthood and joined the Marines. Jamie, at age 18, is becoming a Marine, and he's coming back home for a visit, and he finds out his younger brother, who's 15, has taken a turn. And they said that um, my brother um, was possessed, and they've took him to a Christian psychologist, a Christian um, psychiatrist. And then they took him to a Dr. Matthews who dealt with this uh, up in Michigan. And uh, his expertise was demon possession. He had dealt with about 2000 cases up to that point worldwide. After dealing with my brother for about four hours, he said it was one of the worst cases he faced. I came home to my brother, uh, handcuffed and tied to the bed because at his request. When the demons took over and spoke through him, a uh, stench of like rotten eggs was in the room. Uh, he picked up, my brother was only five foot six, weighed about 150, picked a man over 400 pounds, a deacon in church and threw him across the room. How suddenly did all this come to be? I mean, uh, you were writing to him, you knew this guy, and then suddenly... <sighs> You know, the night before I went to boot camp, there's no indication of this at all, except for the fact that when the pastor had Bible studies with me in preparation to go to boot, he would go to sleep. And when the Bible study was over, he would wake up. And that was one of the signs the pastor was suspecting. Hmm. It wasn't a one-time deal. It was every time the Bible was open. He checked and, out. Yeah. Yeah. So, and he was not trained for this. He had never, ever had to deal with anything like it. It was all first time. So he contacted yeah. Dr. Matthews for guidance. What else was going on in his life? You know, the, the okay. case where it's, uh -huh. it's, you know, it's drugs and it's alcohol and it's Ouija boards and all that. So what, what, is, what, what was the okay. opening portal for your brother? My parents were Satanists. Did you know that? Oh, we knew that, but we, we, just kind of, we dismissed as they were just being idiots. I'm being nice. I hear you. Um, you didn't think it actually meant something. They were just bad people doing whatever, ritualistic things. Yeah, but we knew something was there because of the activity in the home. That's right. what scared us. But we didn't know how deep into it they were, you know. Um, how deep were they? What were they doing? They uh, they practiced crystal ball, tarot cards, Ouija board. Um, they prayed for, to, to the devil for wealth. The connection, uh, my brother was 10 when dad was in a, in a rage one night and uh, he's trying to break the door in from in his bedroom. Uh, and my brother put the, his bed up against the door, the dresser against the bed and the door started giving way. And he was asking God for help. And he figured he might as well ask the devil. So he said, he asked for Satan for help and the door stopped bending. And my brother played with the tarot cards, Ouija board. Um, and that's, that's where it started for him. But my brother did invite them in to help him and to take right. over. Right. So when I came home from boot camp, it made itself known fully at, at that point. 
Um, and he willingly is chained to his bed. He, after he came, the, what it would happen, this, the demons would come over and speak through him. They would take control of his body. And he was, the way he put it, he was put on the edge of a pit. And he could uh, see the fire and hear the voices of screams. And he could hear what's going on in the room, but he's, he's not fully conscious. He's not seeing anybody. Um, it's like he was removed to another place. And then when they left, he would come back and then he'd find out what happened. When he found out that he threw this one guy against the wall, he begged him. He said, please tie me down. I don't want to hurt anybody. On my way home from boot, the demons told him, if you don't give in to us and take your life, we're going to kill your brother coming home. We were, we were very close. So when I walked in and I saw him like that, I just, I got angry. You know, the, the best way I could put it, as a brand new baby Christian, I learned that we have power over these demonic spirits. We're not to have any fear of them. A respect, but not a fear. Um, and I was angry. That's my brother. I mean, you know, nobody messes with my brother. I don't care who you are. Anyway, um, we talked. And he shared with me what was going on. And I was warned. Everybody was at a distance wondering because they didn't know what my stance was with my relationship with God, you know. So the next day, um, my brother-in-law's father was a farmer. He was also a deacon. He needed his farm plowed. So I asked if I could help, and they said, yeah. So they taught me what to do, and I was out in the middle of the field. Um, it was 1130, and I looked at my watch, and I went into prayer, and I just said, God, you know, you said if we ask in your name, you would answer. And I'm asking right now that you just take those demons, and I command them in the name of Jesus to leave my brother. Clean them out. And I claim the blood of Christ on him, clean him out so he can accept Christ and uh, help him to grasp of you. And I did that just crying, claiming verses, just sharing my pain for 45 minutes to 1215. And I'm looking around. Nobody can hear me. I'm in the middle of nowhere. I got a tractor motor running. And uh, so we went in at one o'clock to eat lunch. I'm quiet, listening. And everybody was super quiet. And then uh, my father, brother's brother-in-law's dad said uh, we had a, the worst seizure ever this morning. It was so bad nobody could be in the house. And I asked them what time was it and what happened. They said about 11:30. Uh, the demons started flying out of them. Sorry. Till 12:15. And. Uh, they, they believe they believe at that time that he was ready to, to accept Christ. And uh, I didn't share what happened out in the field. I, I just quietly wept. And uh, to me, that was confirmation that God was, that he heard my prayers. So I went in at, at 2.15 and uh, the pastor's wife was given a verse, uh, Psalm 18, 31. And following, it talks about how God gives our enemies into our hands. And in, in our hands are trained for war, and he will blow them away from our hands as dust and defeat. And um, so my brother asked, can you read that chapter? And I said, yeah. And as I was reading it, he accepted Christ. And it was just a peaceful transference. And uh, so his story, he's a pastor of a church called the uh, Log Cabin Baptist Church up in he Pittsburgh. Be, your brother became a pastor. Oh, he's a well-known pastor in Pittsburgh. Yes, yes, uh, unconventional, and um, he's been to hell and back, literally. Literally, yeah, yeah. Um, oh yeah. Uh, I don't. Is this fitting to what you're looking for? <laughs> yeah, we don't okay. we don't travel down this road often, but we need to. I often, I often bring up Jesus saying that the ruler of this world is the devil. And, and for some reason, I think that's, uh, that preaching isn't preached all that much. And it's not a hell and damnation preach. It's just, here's the facts. Jesus said, I'm not from here. You're not from here. The ruler of the world is the devil. And when you look at him in the world with that concept, you go, okay, now I get it. I don't care what's <laughs> happening in the world. It's a fallen world. Are you okay? Oh, man. You okay? We, we're on the same page. Okay. You know, here I am in Columbia Bible College at the age of 24. I've already spent four years in the Marines, came from a, a 
a home from hell. Uh, you learn quickly not to tell anybody about the beatings and the spiritual things because people don't believe that stuff. Uh, and then even in the church, you, you have to be careful what you say. So here I am. I went to Bible college because I, I wanted to understand how Genesis and Revelation were connected historically. I want to know the message of every book of the Bible. I asked pastors, I asked three pastors years before. I said, I have a double nature. One wants to serve God. The other side wants to raise hell and enjoy the world. What is that? The first two said, we don't know. The third one said, I don't know. And I think you need psychological help. I laughed. I said, half your church feels that and they're afraid to ask you because you're the man of God. So here I am in the first week in Bible college. They had a class that only is a 40-hour class called Bible 101. What is a Christian and what does it mean to be a Christian? And then when they hit Romans chapter 7 where Paul said, in my mind, I know the things I should do, but I don't do. In my body, there are things that I know I shouldn't do, but I end up doing. Who, oh, wretched man I am, who's going to save me from this condition? I threw my pen down when the teacher said, that's how you know you're a believer. You got two natures. You got the nature of the sin nature and the nature of the Holy Spirit and who moves in with you. I said, that's it. That's what I'm looking for. Midway through May, about six or seven people came out to the house. And I, I believe they have to be Pentecostal Christians. So they witnessed to my parents and they asked my dad, would you like to receive Jesus? He said, no, I want to go to hell. They said, okay. <laughs> It turned on my mom and a woman asked her and my mom said, no, thank you. Um, and they turned to leave and they, the woman stopped and turned around and said, God just revealed to me that when you were 13 years old, something happened and you, you blame God for it. And that's what's holding you back from becoming a Christian. So my mom started crying. She said, that's when her parents had a divorce. And uh, yes, yeah, she blamed God for that. And the woman said, saying that I have no knowledge of who you are and that God is here right now and he revealed it. Are you now ready? My mom said, yeah. <laughs> and she got on her knees and accepted Christ. Wow. Yeah. We are now at the end of the life for Jamie's dad. He has cancer. He's going to be gone soon. And Jamie's hopeful, still hopeful for a deathbed conversion. May 1st, uh, dad found out he had cancer of the liver and lungs. He had six to eight weeks left to live. They didn't tell us to Father's Day in June. Um, um, Thursday night, I went in. Dad was in the in his uh, bed in the bedroom in the house. He had a, a basketball-sized tumor on the side of his neck, and uh, I sat next to him. And um, I can be brutally honest in what he said. Uh, so, I might have to bleep it, but uh, you can. Okay. Uh, if you want to, so, if you want to bleep yourself, well, that would probably be beneficial. That, we'll figure out what it means. Well, it's cursing. So I told him I, I loved him and I forgave him for all the things that happened. I said, uh, you know, are you willing to ask Jesus into your life? He said, I'm going to hell. I want to go to hell. Get the hell out of room. Here. I hate your guts. Hmm. Get the hell out. And it, I, you know, the tears start welling up and I thought I can't, I didn't want to give him the satisfaction of crying. And I stood up and I smiled and I said, well, enjoy your death. And I walked out on the other side of the property, knelt at a tree and just wept. You know, for a child to grow up with no love from the parents and then to have your father on his deathbed say that, it's like taking a dagger to your soul and ripping it out. I am so sorry. I am just so sorry. Um, I am no, so sorry. It's, it's a blessing in disguise. You see, the pain that I just shared with you from my, from my situation has opened bridges and doors to reach into the souls of others that people walk by every day and don't even see it. I hope that makes sense. I'm speaking as a counselor, you know? This, this is so mind-boggling what God does with horror, with sin, with the fallen world. He takes it and makes a counselor out of you with it. It's a beautiful thing. I, it's, it's, God amazes me. He dazzles me with how he takes the horrible things in this world and turns it into a positive for, for somebody else. God bless you. God bless you, James. Um, I'll share a couple more things and I'll shut up. I, I guess I have a lot of stories. Um, the next night when my dad died, uh, I consulted when I was in school. I went to a, a, 
a student who's from uh, Africa. And we were good friends. I shared with him about my background. He said, oh, welcome home, brother. We face that every day, you know. <laughs> he said, you in America, you all talk about how you believe there's the devil, but you really don't believe. You know, he said, we see it every day, you know. So, but I consulted with him. I said, is there anything I need to be aware of with my father passing? He said, do not let an animal make contact with the body. He said, if your dad is possessed or has spirits on his body, an animal will make contact with the dead body and the spirits will transfer into the body of the animal until they find another human host. He said he needs to die alone and whatever's in him needs to go. We went in at seven o'clock. Dad was in his bed gasping for air. The lungs were given up. And then he sat up in the bed. Now, my dad, I had never seen him in, in horror. I never saw any fear in him. But he, he sat up screaming, no, no, go away, go away, no. And then that's how he passed. And at the moment he laid down with his last breath, the dog came into the room. I grabbed the dog by the collar and I'm walking him out whispering, you can't have him. And I took him out the front door. As soon as the dog was out, the cat comes running in. I grabbed the cat and I closed the bedroom door and I threw the cat out. And uh, so uh, whatever was in the house died with my dad. Um, we haven't had any problems. Well, the house is sold now to another family, but no more spiritual activities from what we hear. It, it ended um, right then? With the house, yes. Wow. Your mom... Um... My mom, long story short, ended up living with my brother, who's a pastor. She was a bookkeeper. She, she, she For the so church? Yeah, for the church. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And she was so good at it. Uh, the the uh, what what was um, IRS came after them about it, something they wanted their money. And my mom looked it up and she said, "No, you're wrong." And they said, "No, you don't know what you're talking about." She goes, "Put me in charge or in connection with somebody in charge that I know I can talk to." So they did, and she explained what she was looking at with the IRS chapter and lines, whatever they were dealing with. And the supervisor said, yeah, ma'am, you're right. <laughs> you know, that was her gift, you know. Wow. Mom, yeah, mom had uh, uh, to come a long way, and, uh, and she passed away in 86. So when someone says to you, as, as some have said to me, well, I don't believe there's a devil. I think there's human nature that has kind of a darker side. And, you know, um, you know, there's, I don't even know if there's a hell or not. And they live in this world that ignores that nobody talked about the devil or hell more than Jesus. So what do you say to somebody having lived what you've lived? Do you tell your story or do you just look at them and go, oh, what? Um, it depends on the individual I'm talking to. If it's somebody that seems to be open, I, I say, you know, I hear you and I respect that. But I don't criticize the shoes that you walk in because I don't know what you experience. So the story I'm about to tell you, all I ask is just, just listen with your heart and know that I'm not going to lie to you. So I tell them a little bit about what we experienced in home okay, and how I become a Christian. Let me, let me share. Okay. Real quick. There's another story. Called, I call it the voice. Well, the new therapist had heard about me as a layman. And she came to me one day and introduced herself. She goes, I'm Dr. Bracey. You're Mr. G. I said, yes, ma'am. I said, what can I do for you? I've always asked that question. What can I do for you? And she said, I have a brand new intake. Never been in this building before. He's 17 years old from El Salvador. And he, I think he's schizophrenic because he says he hears a voice to hurt people. I said, okay. She says, but he doesn't have all the symptoms. He doesn't actually hurt, him, hurt people. That means he has a choice. And I was, I've heard some of the things you've been able to do with kids. I was wondering if you could talk with them and kind of give me your gut feeling of what you see. I said, sure. So I went over to the room and there's a, at intake cell six and I knocked on the door, opened the door. You know, I'm the only one knocks on doors and open it. And the kids are like, why are you knocking? I go, this is your room. I respect you. You know, it's your home. But anyway, I opened it up and I said, my name is Mr. G. He goes, I knew you were coming. I said, what, the therapist told you? He goes, no, the voice told me. I started laughing. And what I was thinking was, oh, I'm back with my old friends that I grew up with. And I said, well, tell me, tell me, what, 
tell me more about this voice. He said, well, the voice uh, is afraid of two people. I said, who are they? He goes, my dad. I said, why is it afraid of your dad? He goes, my dad's a Christian. And I said, okay, who's the other one? He goes, you. I said, why me? He said, I don't know, but it don't, it don't like you. And you couldn't stay in a room with me. Uh, when you came in, I had to go. And I looked him in the eyes. I said, can I be brutally honest with you? He goes, yeah. I said, you're not possessed. You have a demon that's uh, attached to the outside of your body. And it's there to drain you and to cause hell for you. I said, I have no idea where it came from. But do you want to get rid of it? He goes, yeah. He said, I love my dad. I don't want this to become between me and my dad. And I said, well, not to be afraid of it. I said, uh, tonight at visitation, it was visitation night. I said, when your dad comes in, the best gift you give to your dad and to yourself is to ask Jesus into your heart. When you do, the Holy Spirit will come inside you. The blood will seal you, protect you against any de demonic possession. Um, I said, you, you might get attacked, get beat up by demons like all of us do, but that's an everyday thing. I said, but you don't have to have that voice on you anymore. You'll be claimed. And uh, that which is holy is the Holy Spirit who lives in me. I said, I'm not good enough for God. I, I said, actually, the closer I get to God, the filthier I feel about myself because I actually see myself in his eyes and in his light. I see all the sin that I have, you know. I said, but I'm grateful and I'm thankful that I have a father who loves me. And I said, it's just a beautiful thing when you know that God loves you and you, you enjoy it. And I smiled and I said, you'll be protected. He goes, okay. So that night he did do that. He did. He accepted Christ that night. It was so awesome. But after I talked to him, I shook his hand. I thanked him. And I went and sat down with the therapist and I told her what happened. And she's staring at me like I was crazy. I said, look. You asked me to talk to the boy. I didn't ask to be born into the family I had. So I just used the gifts and the, and the weapons that I have to help others. Obviously, this is not a normal thing. So you, what's the rest of the story that you know? She said when he was six years old in El Salvador, the father was concerned about the MS-13 and the murders and everything going on. He took his son to a shaman. And asked the shaman to put a spirit of protection on him. And he did. And that's when the voice began to speak. It's real, isn't it? It's real. This, this, me, this spiritual mm -hmm. realm, it's all real. Yes. On ship, when I was in the Marines, I had um, three guys. I didn't do drugs. Um, they thought I was a narcotics agent. And uh, Baker was the leader of the three constantly threatened to kill me, throw me overboard. So this one night, it was super cold. Um, I don't know if you've ever been on ship, but on the ship, you have an outer hatch, an outer door, and an inner door. That way, the water can't come into the inner side, inner part of the ship. And uh, so I opened the outer door, and there's a red light. And uh, I'm, I'm six foot, and I had to look up to this guy that was way over seven foot. And I'm not thinking height. I just said, excuse me. And he goes, you don't want to go through that door. He said, there's three guys waiting there to throw you overboard. I knew who he's talking about. He said, your two buddies, Mitch and Quita. He said, they're, they're up at the candy store. Go up there and they're, they're going to help you. But you don't want to go through this door. I said, no problem. Thank you. And I backed off. And I went up on the outside to the second level where the... Um, candy store was and as i got up there mitch and quita showed up and i told them what was going on because i'm thinking i don't want to die you know so they said hey let's go rough them up both these guys grew up as catholics they got involved in uh hell's angels and got in trouble and then the judges said you either go to jail or you join the marines well they joined the marines <laughs> these, are the, these are the kind of friends i made you know <laughs> yeah. so we we went down and we jacked him up against the wall. And I, I told him, I said, you thinking about throwing me overboard? How did you know? How did you know? I said, ah, I got people watching over me, man. I, I got protection. And I dropped them. I said, get out of here. And they, they went running like little rats, you know. So I went up and bought soda and candy bars, took my buddies to the highest level of the ship. And I had them one on each side of me. And we we're laughing how, how they all reacted and how cool it was and how it worked out. And then Quita says, hey, uh, how did you know we were coming into the candy store? And I said, well, the guy told me. And Mitch said, what did the guy say? And I told him. And then it dawned on me. I said, man, I was looking up at this guy. And Quita goes, dude, that was 
that that couldn't have been normal. I mean, how did he know what door you were going into? And how did he know we were we weren't even there until you showed up? And Mitch goes, dude, do you realize you came across an angel? If not an angel, some dude that God sent? He, and they and Quita goes, Man, I'm gonna be your best friend if God's with you like that. <laughs> we were laughing. And then I, I had no idea. And nobody I hadn't reached the point of understanding angels or anything like that in my walk with God. So they explained it to me and I said, Well, where in the Bible it says it? They said, Well, we'll we'll show you. And they showed it to me. I'm like, holy smoke. Oh, they're all over the place. Angels are everywhere, opening up jail cells and <laughs> everything else in the in the Bible. Well, that was the, the dude on ship. Well, let me um, ask you here. I, how long you had you been on this ship when that happened? About four months. And you had never seen the seven-foot sailor no, before. No, 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 they can't be in the military. They're too tall. Yeah, and suddenly you got one. Well, yeah, I, I wasn't thinking about her. I was thinking about survival. Yeah. You know, I, what that, a cool story. I mean, talk about, yeah, talk about an angel. He's too tall well, to be in the service. You've never seen him before in four months, and you never saw him again, did you? Oh no, yeah. no. There's um when I was a youth minister, uh, you know, God, God gave me a dream to verify the fact I was supposed to come up to the D.C. area, and uh, the ministry just exploded. And when I first sat down with the youth council, I um I explained to them what I wanted to do. I wanted to teach them the Bible from the viewpoint of history and science. I said, too many people say they believe because that's what grandma said. I said, I'm going to teach you how to defend your faith with facts. I said, knowledge is power. And I said, I want to do Bible studies with them on Saturdays in the evenings, pizza, Coke, all of them rolled their eyes like, oh, you got to be kidding me. And I looked at them and I said, are you kidding me? You think the Bible is boring? Let me tell you something. The Bible is a book that not only tells you where you came from and where you're headed, it also tells you that you were saved from that which the curse of sin has created, which is hell. God sent a son to love you and to be with you. And you go to church and you're the only hope that some of these people have? Nah, I wasn't hired to waste my time like this. I said, so if you want to come, you come. If you don't, you don't. And that's how I started it. And three of those kids were the pastor's kids. My, my whole thing is that everything that's going on that went on in the Bible, that's in the Bible, is still going on today. You want to make the Bible come to life, just tell your stories about demon possession, link it to the old, you know, those, those, those stories in the Bible, and it all comes to life. It all, and Jesus saying the ruler of the world is the devil suddenly means something. It's just that that connection isn't done because we don't acknowledge the devil now. We don't acknowledge it. The angels, by the way, retired and are living on their 401ks in Florida, apparently, because we don't hear about them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and they're still all around us. This drives me nuts. This, don't get me well, don't get me started. But th- well, this my, this my. is <laughs> what you're bringing. By the way, do you know what today is? This is the feast day of Saint James. This is the what? The feast day of Saint James. James of Apostle fame. It's his feast day within the church. Just so you know, James. Oh, I, I didn't know that. Well, there that's you go. Awesome. Yeah, thought you might want to know that. That's why. That's why people think church is boring and Bible's boring. That they don't. Yeah. Yeah. Then there's Wayne. Wayne was a um, the son of a praying woman in the church, uh, a warrior, prayer warrior. Wayne joined the mill- uh, the Navy and spent about six years, and then they kicked him off from marijuana use. Wayne was a big, burly guy. His arms about the size of my legs. Um, you hit him, it's like hitting a brick wall. And I, I'm a Marine. I, I could take people down pretty good, but Wayne's one of the few I've never been able to budge. So after church... <clears throat> One day, I was uh, at the church about a year. Wayne was out front smoking a cigarette with his poncho and sunglasses on. And uh, his mom asked me to talk to him about becoming a Christian. I said, I'll try, but I'm going to be honest. I don't think he wants to hear me. I said, well, I'll, I'll do that. So I went and I approached him in my suit and my, my sunglasses. And I told him, I said, your mom asked me to talk to you about becoming a Christian. He told me where to go. I laughed. He said, what's so funny? I said, you, you remind me of me. I said, my door's always open, man. I said, I'm always here, so I'm not going to push it. Four years later, my youth leadership came to me and said, there's a girl who's in a satanic group 
that's tied into the drug trafficking between Washington, D.C. and New York City. And she went to three other churches. They knew her at high school. And she's asking pastors for help. And all three pastors told her they didn't want her there when they found out her story. And they asked me, is it okay if she can come here? I said, yeah, yeah. I came home one day and there was an envelope at three o'clock in the afternoon laying on my doorstep. And I opened it up and uh, I had grabbed my um, wireless phone. And uh, in the letter, it said that it described where my kids went to and from school and what times. And it said, we will kill your kids if you don't, if you continue working with Penny. I'm sitting there stunned. I'm like, you know, and the phone rings. This is four years after I talked to Wayne. I go, hello. He goes, hey, this is Wayne. And I said, what do you, why are you calling me, Wayne? He goes, I heard a voice. I'm like, oh, geez, here we go. <laughs> so I thought, I'm going to go for the juggler. I said, okay, well, what did the voice say? He said, the voice said that God was going to kill me if I didn't become a Christian. I said, well, did you? He goes, oh, yeah. Yeah, I did. It's real. I said, well, why are you calling me? He said, the voice said I had two years left to live. Can I live with you for six months to a year? Can you teach me everything you know from your heart and your mind? Because I, I don't have time to go to school if this is true. So I, I said, let me read to you this letter. And I read it to him. He goes, oh, hell, you don't know what I've been doing for four years? I go, no. I've been working for the mob. I've been getting rid of the bodies. I said, how soon can you get here? I need a bodyguard. I talked to Penny and shared with her about the, the letter. She had a little bit of knowledge about it. She goes, yeah, I had heard they threatened. I said, I'm going to do something. I said, you guys are putting me in a corner and I'm done. I said, I'm not going to be nice anymore. I'm going to pray that God, I'm going to claim the blood of Christ upon your group. And her eyes got big. And I'm going to pray that God will take care of you and get rid of them. That's the same as putting a hit on a, on a person from a Christian perspective to a Satanist. A week later, the leader of the group went to New York to do a drug deal, ran into a rival group, and they shot him 28 times. That, day, that same night, the FBI made over 100 arrests of the drug traffickers. So wow. um, that was right before Easter. Uh, Easter morning, I just got up extra early, get ready to go to church. Um, we started Sunday school, no penny. About 10 minutes into it, she comes through the door. Sorry. She had blood on her face. She was dirty, hair was a mess, and she was in shock. And she looked at me and I said, hello. And I turned my uh, lady counselors. I said, take her into the kitchen, clean her up, get her something to eat, form a circle around her and quietly pray around her. I turned to my men and I said, circle the women just in case they need physical help and pray and claim the blood of Christ. I said, that's all you need to do. She had a friend that was killed the night before as a sacrifice. Oh, geez. And there's the police were involved. What do you mean police were involved? Uh, they found the body. They just needed a witness. And so we had to get involved by having her talk to the police. How did she get blood on her? She was there. I, I didn't I didn't ask the details. It was just a bad scenario. Yeah. But then uh she became a Christian and uh and then with the FBI, she was placed in a witness protection program, and she was taken out of the state. Um, she is that still her situation now, as far as you know? Well, I found out that she has a farm out west. I don't know where it is, but she's adopted seven girls, and she's teaching them about Jesus and how to <laughs> wow. life skills. Look what you're doing, James. You're you're something, man. Well, look, I heard you on the radio, and to me, you're the guru. You know. And I, I'm a student sharing with you. I, I just got so excited. I thought you he's got to hear some of the stuff. Oh, my gosh. You know? I'm no guru. I'm no guru. I'm going through all this stuff, too. You know, you and I both, you know, you, your upbringing was horrific, and God has taken the horror and turned it into this huge positive for so many people. I'm taking a lot of your time. I'm going to close this off with uh, Wayne and uh, uh, the, what happened with him. So... Uh, a month before the two years were up for Wayne, I was going through an ordeal where the pastor was lying about things about me, was trying to get me fired. Found out that in the investigation of all this, that he had done it to two other youth ministers 
and neither of them recovered. It was a mental health destruction. But what happened was I was so used to being abused as a child, it didn't matter to me. And uh, they ended up firing him. So Wayne came over one night and we were walking late at night, talking, sharing, laughing about everything that happened, praising God for what he did, just laughing about how he answers prayers and how much he's blessed us. And then it got real quiet and he said, you know, the month in a month, it's going to be two years. I said, I know. He said, do you think it's real? I said, Wayne, if it's real, then you're in a better place. If it's not, God already did a wonderful work for you. I said, I, I'll take either way, you know, but I'd rather keep you, you know. So um, two weeks later, I get a phone call that he was working underneath a car. And uh, the jack broke and crushed him to death. His mom called and asked me to do the funeral. I, I said, it'd be my honor. Um, we were like brothers. So when I got up, I looked down at them and I shared with them about the voice. They had no knowledge, not even his mom. So I told the story about the voice and how I talked to Wayne and how he changed. And then I said, last summer, we prepared his funeral just in case. And I had a message. I had a message for every member of the family and for the church and for the folks that came that don't go to church. We had over 1,200 people at his service. Half of them didn't go to church. Um, uh, so that's the story about Wayne. Um, about a month after that, I got a call from a friend saying, would you be interested in working as a relief worker at juvenile detention up in Fairfax? I said, I'd love to. Um, when I got there and, and walked through the building with the lady that developed the program, it was a family style approach. A lot of the workers didn't buy into it because they were thugs. I understood what she was trying to do, create a home away from home, trying to teach kids respect and how to function properly, how to have a family. And uh, she was very good at it. She was an atheist. And uh, so she turned to me, she said, so do you think you could work with these kids seeing that you worked in church? I looked at her, I said, I've had a 38 stuck in my belly. I've had people threaten my family. I'm a Marine. Yeah, I could deal with this, you know. So I, I but, like it when your uh, your spirit is raised. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome, man. So, but when I got there, I thought, oh my gosh! And I I had a dream a, a week before that, uh, before the interview, before I came up here to be interviewed. I dreamt of a of a I was sitting in a car, and to my right, I was facing a river. I looked to my right, and there's a superstructure of a highway. And upstream on my left is a dam. There's a little old town. So I did the interviews for the pastor. They voted me in, 98% vote. And I met with the pastor before I left, and he's looking out the window. And, I, and I'm like, I wonder what's, what, he, what is he doing, you know? And I asked him, I said, is something wrong? He goes, no. No, he said, I had a dream. I thought, uh-oh. And he looked at me. He said, I had a dream that I came up against the biggest test of my life and you were sent to help me, but I, I didn't pass it. So I said, well, I had a dream and I told him my dream. He got excited. He just get in the car. He took me down to Occoquan in Virginia and he showed, he pulled right down into the boat ramp. And I said, there's the dam and there's the bridge. And uh, it was exactly what I dreamt. So, and the last one I'll share with you is about cat. This is uh, one night when he was at Denny's with a buddy, and they're leaving about 3 a.m. As I, After I paid, I turned, and Rhett was facing me, talking to a young lady and her boyfriend in her late teens. She had satanic symbols, witch symbols all over her jacket. And I looked at her, and I said, I don't know why I'm saying this, but I'm going to tell you, something's wrong with your lungs, and if you don't get help, you're going to be dead in 18 months. Her boyfriend goes, damn girl you tell them the truth that's what the doctor said today and she her eyes just bulged the mouth opened and she said the doctor said today i have emphysema and if i don't have it treated i'll be dead in 18 months and her boyfriend goes now god's talking to you what are you going to do with it and i'm like i said are you a christian she goes no 
but my mother mom is and she's a praying woman and I've, i i don't like it and i said well seeing that god is here are you now ready to accept christ because he is not playing games with you she said yes and she became a christian that night last i heard she was studying to be a, a nurse <laughs> isn't that beautiful yeah so i mean the spirit is so strong in you jamie god bless you and uh you know, and what what amazes me about God is he, I always call it, he looks at the DVR, you know, because he looks at our entire life. He can, he could do that, you know, and he goes, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty crappy at the beginning, but look what we're going to do later with this guy, you know, and, and look what he's done with you. He, he gives you this hellish start and then says, yeah, you'd be a good Marine. Okay, we'll do that. And then we'll get a little ministry. Oh, my gosh. And, that, and you're the same spirit. That's why I contacted you. Yeah, but, um, but I'd not, you've, you've, where, wasn't real connected. I didn't have that. I, I grew up in a, in a loving family, not perfect, but mm-hmm. a loving family. And we all left the church. Some of us have come back, but everybody has a, a, a goodness about them. That's what I love about my siblings. They all have, they all have God in them, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. my gosh, well, to take, to take, to, and he's just, he just keeps molding. He just keeps purifying. Anyway, thank you for your time. And, uh, I've enjoyed it. Thank you for letting me be honest. Great stuff, Jamie. Great stuff. Sure. You're going to, uh, you're going to impact a lot of people. It's amazing. It's just unbelievable. Thanks again, Jamie. Wow. Huh? Yeah. Children find God despite parents. Sometimes. Yeah. I mean, the conversion for all three kids is just nothing short of remarkable. But again, is there a heaven? Yes. Is there a hell? Yes. Is there a God? Yes. Is there a Satan? Yes. And I mean, I mean, he's lived it all out. He's lived it all out. And isn't it amazing for both Jamie and his pastor brother and the sister that led him both out of the darkness, what God can do with something so evil and convert. I mean, and mom converts. Dad, you pray, you know. Uh, he's had his temporary judgment, whatever it may be, and uh, there was a final judgment. So there's still hope for dad as well. Quite a story. Thank you again, Jamie. I tell you, we just can't, we can't judge anybody by the little bit we know. Only God knows our hearts, right? Only God knows everything we have been through, everything. So just a reminder for me too, let's, let's not judge. This is a big reason why we just can't. I need your story. You have one? The the one you're sitting on, uh, let me know. Come to touchedbyheaven.net and uh, contact me there. Okay. My Patreon shout out this week uh, goes to Amy, our latest Amy. Uh, it, that's how that's how she wants to be known. I think the latest Amy, who's uh, helping us out on a monthly basis uh, at Patreon. You go to patreon.com uh, direct and just search for Trapper Jack, or come here at episode one thirty one at touchedbyheaven.net and just click through on the links. We thank you so much. If these episodes are doing for you what they're doing for me too, um, just God bless you for any consideration for helping us do what we do here at Touch by Heaven. Thank you so much. If they fortify your faith or bring you to your faith and would like to help us out, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, Also, uh, thanks for keeping us a five-star podcast. You do that with your ratings and reviews, okay? Okay. Oh, and if you want a weekly email of other Touch by Heaven in this universe kinds of stories and links and links to videos and such, come here to episode 131 and just click the Stay Informed link and we'll uh, add you to the email list as well. All right? All right, see you next week here at Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God. I'm Trapper Jack.